Over to you, Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Assalamu alaikum, and ni hao to our friends in China. It's a great pleasure to be here to see some friends virtually whom I've not seen for a while. And uh, I think the topic is very important and just get to the point immediately. First of all, a little bit of the geopolitical context, which is very important. We are witnessing in 2022 some Im very important historic changes. One is very clear, the inexorable shift in the global balance of economic and political power away from the West to the East. We see a general decline of the West. And by a West, I mean the United States of America, which I just visited recently in uh, November. And I had a good interaction with people in the Congress, think tanks in Washington. And the America that I knew when I was a student and the America of today is almost beyond recognition. It's so changed. And uh, that, uh, and also the decline in Europe, particularly, uh, a lot of divisions, a lot of crises in parts of Europe. So that's the first important premise. The second one is the peaceful rise of China. And I think uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs in the documentary that we showed got it right, that uh, the US is not able to confront China or compete with China in the area of high tech. And I would refer all of you to a very good study which I've just read which came out uh, last month by Harvard University on 7th of December, 2021. Professor Graham Allison has authored the study. It's called The Great Tech Rivalry, China versus the United States. And he says in that study, it's 52 pages, it's on the internet. China has displaced the US as the world's biggest high-tech manufacturer. And he cites, some figures, 1.5 billion cell phones produced by China in 2020, 250 million computers, 25 million automobiles. And if you link that with the recent report of the IMF on China, that China registered a growth of over 8%, despite the uh, coronavirus pandemic, despite uh, what people had been saying, uh, in 2021, that shows that China has bounced back. And I think that's extremely important. That's the second important aspect. Third, two of the states which are leading in this new Cold War, one the US and the other India, are facing a very serious crisis internally. The United States is almost evenly divided. It's almost a political civil war between the Democrats and the Republicans. And this is likely to aggravate because this is an election year. And if indications, present indications continue, Trump will likely to be back. First, the Republicans this year will capture the Congress and then Trump in 24, if present indications hold. And our next door neighbor, India is going through a very serious crisis because uh, under Modi, they're trying to transform the nature of the Indian state into a republic of Hindutva based on divisions, cleavages, confrontation, and marginalization of the minorities. And that will not work. So in both countries who are leading the bandwagon against China, there are very serious internal crises which are likely to increase both in the United States and in, the, in India. And in the geopolitical context, we see also, thanks to the Belt and Road Initiative, which is probably the most important developmental and diplomatic initiative of the 21st century, uh, emergence of what I call the Greater South Asia as a geoeconomic concept, including China, countries in South Asia like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, and Bangladesh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Central Asia, as well as Iran and Afghanistan. So driven by economy, driven by energy, ports, pipelines, road railways, a whole new world is opening up. And Pakistan is at the hub of this regional connectivity. Only India is uh, one country which is away from it. And the US, despite its opposition to BRI, has launched a copycat program 
called the B3W, Build Back Better World. And the Europeans have also launched a copycat program called Global Gateway. So as they say, imitation is the highest form of flattery. They may oppose BARI, but they want to be in the same line with the Chinese and try to cop have a copycat program. So let's see how it will operate. When we come to the current situation with China, we see, I'm reminded of an article I read a long time ago in the New York Times, which shows the mindset of the American security establishment. That article appeared on 13th November, 1991, soon after the Cold War was over. The break of, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and America was seeing itself as a sole superpower. The article was written by a very influential American who has since died. He was a New York Times correspondent and then also worked in the State Department, then also as the chairman of uh, uh, a lot of think tanks. Uh, Leslie, chairman of uh, Council of Foreign Relations. Yes, Chairman of Council of Foreign Relations, Leslie Gelb. The title of the article was, and this is the article in the New York Times, Breaking China Apart. This was the title of an op-ed in the New York Times by Leslie Gelb, the chairman of the Council of Foreign Relations, Breaking China Apart. And it said that the U.S. might encourage separatism against China and U.S will may take extraordinary measures to kindling separatism to ch stop China if China does not fall in line, quote unquote. 13th of November, 1991. So I think that that kind of vision, that kind of mindset of the so-called soul superpower is in uh, operation now when it comes to Xinjiang. I call it the three Ds approach. First, you demonize a country. This happened with Iraq, this happened with Afghanistan, with Syria. It's the same pattern, or Russia now, under Putin. Demonize, then you damage its reputation that, through constant propaganda, and then you destabilize. So demonize, damage, and destabilize, and then destabilize. And what are the steps they have taken in this new Cold War against China? There are specific steps. And there, I will list five of those measures. Separately, you can connect the dots. October, first week of October 2020, the United States lifts the ban on ETIM, which they had certified in 2002, along with the United Nations as a separatist and terrorist organization. East Turkestan Islamic Movement. And the UN still retains that uh, label of terrorism, but the US has lifted it. Similar to the way they lifted the ban on the MKO, Mujahideen Khalq Organization against Iran, when they wanted to use the MKO in Iraq against Iran under the Bush administration. And after that, they had declared it excess of evil in 2002. The pattern is similar. So they lifted the ban. Secondly, the step taken, 26th of October, 2020, one week before the American presidential elections, Pompeo, the Secretary of State of the US, and Esper, the Secretary of Defense of the US, fly into Delhi to sign the BECA, Basic Exchange Cooperation Agreement, BECA with India, which is a strategic agreement to rope in India before the American presidential elections. So it means there's a consensus between the Republicans or and the Democrats. And it follows two other agreements. 2018, it was COMCASA on communication and data exchange, intelligence exchange. And in 2016, it was LEMOA, Logistics Exchange Memorandum of Association. And at the same time in 2018, the Americans renamed the Asia Pacific Command as the Indo-Pacific Command. When Admiral Harris, the Commander in Chief said, from Hollywood to Bollywood, we will have cooperation. And then they announced in the 2003 study, NATO 2030 document listed in November 2021 says, China is one of the major threats and challenges for NATO. As far as my understanding of geography goes, China is never part by which stretch of the imagination is China part of the North Atlantic? 
So they have, China has now been put on the NATO agenda as a threat along with Russia. This was done. So part of the new Cold War. Then they established the AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, Australia, UK, United States. They have the Quad, which includes Asian, but the AUKUS is more of a white man's club. Australia, UK, and US. It doesn't include Japan and uh, India, who are Asian countries. So that was also very clearly uh, because they want to now uh, uh, bring it uh, together as part of the pivot of the Cold War in uh, Asia Pacific. And the fifth aspect, I've listed all the steps they have taken for this new Cold War, was a recent passage of what is called the Strategic Competition Act by the US Congress. This is China specific. 270 pages. And in that, there is a $300 million annual, and I quote the name of the fund called Countering China Influence Fund. This is the name. So there's, it's officially now clear that it is to counter and combat China propaganda, demonization, and you will see a lot of the money flowing in here also in different parts of the world. Although there are 145 countries in BRI and 32 international organizations, but they will continue with that. So this is what this whole situation is all about, the context. I'm just stating the facts which are there. And I think Sabah Aslam had a point when he talked of Chinese people and the relationship with the uh, Communist Party of China. Please see this survey published by the Harvard University, by the Ash Center, which is part of Harvard University, in July 2020, which was a 17 year continuous study of Chinese public opinion, about 32,000 Chinese over a period of time, their views of the Communist Party of China and the governance. And the figures are astounding. Over 90% support and are satisfied with rule by the Communist Party of China in China. Because the reason is their lives are better off than before. <laughs> better than their forefathers, their parents, their grandparents. So uh, uh, the Communist Party of China has provided stability, continuity, peace and prosperity to the people of China. So it is in this context we are seeing this issue. We in Pakistan are very clear and uh, I think the statements uh, which came from Dr. Ajaz Akram, my good friend, and I compliment him and wish him good luck in his new role. And also Dr. Shirin Mazari, the Minister of Human Rights are there's strategic clarity where we stand and who do we stand with. And in this context, we congratulate our Chinese friends on the upcoming new year, the year of the tiger. And together, uh, the tigers in Pakistan and Asia will unite to uh, combat any other uh, uh, hounds or any other kind of uh, people who try to undermine our relationship. And we also congratulate the Chinese people on uh, the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics. We are very happy that the Prime Minister of Pakistan is also going to be uh, there at the inaugural ceremony on 3rd of February and 4th of February and 5th of February. And I would uh, also take up what Professor Li Shi Guang has said. Li Shi Guang is a uh, Chinese Marco Polo because he goes to different places physically, personally. Yeah. And uh, I had the honor and pleasure five years ago of receiving him at the head of a 22 member uh, delegation of students and scholars from Tsinghua and other universities in Hong Kong when he came by road from Kashgar uh, through uh, the Karakram Highway and I, we received him at the tunnels which the Chinese have built after the Atabat Lake uh, problem. And I compliment him the launching of the Wakhan Corridor Airport at Tashkargaon. I think it's a very major development. In May 2022, it will be inaugurated and that means from Islamabad to Tashkargaon will take 40 to 45 minutes by jet. So the connectivity is going to be strong. And this connectivity is not just with Islamabad, it's with Kabul, with Dushanbe, with Ashkabad, with Tashkand, with Samarkand, with Bukhara, and uh, all the other countries of, uh, and also Almaty and Bishkek, so, uh, and um, Mashhad and Tehran. So I think that uh, we are having, seeing this new connectivity in Pakistan is very fortunate because of our role and because of our location, we are a pivotal player. And in this, uh, we have this very strong solidarity. 
China has been facing problems like any other countries. Xinjiang has been a problem. Tibet, you can already see the separatist movement has its headquarters in India, in Dharamshala, led by the Dalai Lama. Hong Kong also, when Hong Kong un unrest started, it was very interesting to see Chinese uh, protests being shown on Indian television because the Indian television teams flew to Hong Kong as if on cue to disseminate those uh, things. Uh, and I remember five, six years ago when I used to go to Xinjiang, it was a state of siege almost because there were two, three acts of terrorism every fortnight, every month or so. We have had a problem of terrorism. Pakistan even used the Air Force to bomb uh, people in uh, our own uh, uh, territory on terrorism. So China is handling its issue and it has restored peace without resorting to the uh, such violence which we have seen in other countries. But obviously, as uh, Professor Li Shi Guang says, there are attempts now to make it into what happened in Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, and other places in the Muslim world. And of course, China will not allow that. And no other country can allow that. And you can see what happened in Kazakhstan also, that uh, there was this uh, intervention because they realized that uh, there was after Afghanistan, then there could be more instability in the region. So we in Pakistan value our strong friendship and solidarity with China. We support China on its core interests, be it Xinjiang, be it Taiwan, be it Tibet, be it Hong Kong, be it the South China Sea, and be it the Belt and Road Initiative. And we feel that uh, this region, after 42 years of war in Afghanistan, can not return to any kind of a new war, whether hot or cold. And we reject this notion of a new Cold War or this mindset, which is aimed at cleavages, conflict, and confrontation. So wishing you all a happy new year. Please stay safe from the Omicron virus, which is spread like wildfire even in Pakistan. And of course, China has had success in that uh, with the zero COVID approach. And, with, and we wish you all the best in the Olympics, which are upcoming, and Pakistan is one of the participants, and Pakistan is rejecting the boycott of these Olympics, which is politically motivated, and which is also, again, another lever, another instrument, another tool of the so-called new Cold War against China, which is bound to fail, because we should be on the right side of history, and the right side of history is the resurgence of Asia in the Asian century in which Pakistan and China are strategic partners and iron brothers. Thank you very much.